Shabbat Shalom. Our Parsha for this week has several big stories in it. Jacob's return to Canaan, his wrestling match with an angel, his reunion with brother Esau, uh, daughter Diana's <clears throat> rape, Levi and Simeon's anal annihilation of the city of Shechem, the death of Rebecca, uh, death of Rachel, Reuben sleeping with Bela, his father's concubine, the death of Isaac, and the genealogy of Esau. Each story follows the other so closely, it is hard to observe the passage of time, and one is easily overwhelmed by all these stories as one reads them through because they're just boom, boom, boom right after each other. So let's look at time first to help us get oriented. This series of events starts back when Esau was 40 years old and married two Canaanite women. Isaac was 60 when the boys were born, so Isaac is 100 at this point. Soon after Esau gets married, Jacob steals his brother's blessing and is sent to live with Uncle Laban and Padden Aram. Aram. The youngest Jacob can be at this time is 40, although given his behavior, he feels much younger. Jacob spends 20 years living with and working for his uncle Laban. 14 of these years are spent serving for his two wives, and then six years are spent acquiring flocks and herds. When Jacob has been with his uncle for seven years, he marries Leah and Rachel meaning Reuben, his eldest, is a maximum of 12 years old when the family returns to Canaan. Jacob returns to Canaan with two wives, two concubines, 11 sons, and one daughter that we know of, and a huge amount of livestock. Um, 40, Esau's age at the beginning of this series of events, plus 20, time in, time in Paddan Aram, equals 60, which is the youngest Jacob can be at the beginning of this Parsha when he returns to Canaan. And, and you know, quite bluntly, that just seems a little bit on the elderly side. He might be older, depending on how long he stayed at home after stealing his brother's blessing. However, given how angry his brother Esau was, this period of time was probably not very long. At the end of our Parsha, Isaac dies at the age of 180. Since Isaac was 60 when his sons were born, they must be 120 at this point, meaning that our Parsha covers approximately 60 years, which I don't know about you, but that came as a surprise to me when I worked out the math because somehow it just didn't, when they were so banged together, it, it didn't feel like there was that much time passing. But there is. Our upcoming Parshas are about Joseph. One is tempted to think the stories of Joseph comes after these stories of Jacob. However, Joseph is sold by his brothers at age 17. And he could only have been, you know, like two, probably, when he enters Canaan. So this is 15 years into the 60-year time span so his stories would have been would have happened sometime during the above events when jacob and joseph are reunited in egypt jacob tells pharaoh that he is 130 years old which means that jacob's trip to egypt is only 10 years after his father has died i like putting things in chronological order so i hope that just seemed important to me. While Isaac is probably my favorite man in the Torah, Jacob is my least favorite. Our early stories of Jacob show him to be um, to be manipulative, manipulative, a liar, and eager to use someone for his own gain. He tricked his brother out of his birthright for a bowl of soup. Perhaps he had observed his brother and felt he was more deserving of the birthright. And perhaps he was, since Esau had no second thoughts about giving it away. However, 
Was there a kinder way to acquire this? Or was trickery and taking advantage of his brother the only way? I suspect a kinder option was available, <clears throat> but Jacob did not choose to take that option. Years later, when his parents were older and his father was having vision problems and feeling mortal, his father decided to give Esau the blessing of the eldest son. Mom, Rebecca, suggested to Jacob that he should get the blessing and how to do it. Jacob's only concern was dad might find out. He had no problems with stealing the blessing. His only concern was he might get caught and get into trouble before acquiring his prize. Esau was justifiably angry. At no time do we see Jacob showing any remorse for tricking his father and his brother. The brothers are 40 years old at this time. I personally would expect more mature behavior of a 40 year old. We don't see it. When he got to Paddan Aram, Aram Jacob found someone who was just as self-centered and manip manipulative as he was. Jacob said he would serve Laban seven years for his younger daughter, Rachel. When the time of the wedding celebration arrived, Laban dumped his elder daughter, Leah, on Joseph, Jacob on their wedding night, then required Jacob to work another seven years for the wife he thought he had worked for, for the, with the first seven years. Yes, Jacob was allowed to marry Rachel the week after he married Leah. Hmm, not impressed. But he still had to work 14 years for the woman of his dreams after he had been promised he could have her in exchange for seven years of work. Leah was just thrown in without her permission and certainly not with, a, with Jacob's permission or Rachel's permission. Jacob did not love Leah but he had no choice in marrying her. Laban didn't care. He just wanted to dump his daughter so he didn't have to be responsible for them anymore. Jacob was not impressed and he hated Leah as if she was in some way responsible for Jacob not getting what he wanted. Yes, in Paddan Aram, Jacob found someone as unscrupulously, as unscrupulous as he himself was. These were hard years for everyone. After 14 years of working for his wife and her sister and producing several children, Jacob was finally allowed to work for pay. So he would have some way to support his wives and children. But even then, Uncle Laban kept changing his wages 10 times. And Jacob had to use his wits in order to acquire, acquire anything. Did Jacob ever think of how he had treated Esau and his father and realize he was receiving back the same treatment he had given out when he was back in Canaan? Maybe. I hope so. Finally, after 20 years, things are so bad, Jacob took time out to talk to God about it and talk to his wives about it and make a plan to go home. Did you notice something strange here? This is only the second time we hear about Jacob talking to God. Weird. Abraham and Isaac wandered all over the country, building altars to thank and praise God and to offer sacrifice. We have several stories of them talking to God. And God talking to them. Jacob set up a pillar at the place God spoke to him from the top of the ladder and said, if you want to be my God, these are the things you need to do. There are no altars. Jacob tells his wives and Laban that God is on his side, and that is why Laban's schemes against him didn't work. However, there are no altars. There are no conversations with God. And this feels odd to me. After 20 years in Padanaram, is God still on trial to see if God is worth keeping? I don't know. 
So Jacob and his company sneak away from Laban, Laban and start on their journey south to home, to the promised land. Jacob has 12 children, all under 12 years old at this point. Lots of cattle, including young animals who have to be moved slowly and carefully so they don't get very far before Laban catches up with them. Laban tells Jacob that God spoke to him and told him to say nothing to Jacob either for good or evil. Otherwise, he would have killed Jacob for stealing his daughters and his grandchildren. But a loving uncle, father-in-law. <sighs> Jacob said that God had been the one who protected him the 10 times Laban had changed his wages. And God was protecting him now because otherwise Laban would have taken everything and left Jacob with nothing. Both threatened the other with God's anger. And then they set up a heap of stones as witness against the other in case the other might think of passing the heap to do evil. Then they have a meal together to seal their promises to each other. There is no healing. No kindness is exchanged. While God's name is spoken, it is used as a curse against the other. Ouch. And Jacob is again running for his life, just as he ran from Esau 20 years earlier. But this time he has a huge company he is responsible for. And like his flight 20 years earlier, Jacob is not looking to God for guidance, but is leaning entirely on his own wit and cunning. The next morning, Jacob and company are on their slow way home. They have extracted themselves from the last 20 years of pain and are wandering into the unknown with fear and trepidation, not knowing what will meet them on the journey and their only hope that it will be better than what they left. Where is God in all this? As Jacob arrives at the border of the promised land, he sends messengers to his brother Esau to announce that he has returned. The message return, the messengers return with the news that Esau is coming to meet him with 400 men. Hmm. What does Esau think when he hears his brother has returned? Have you thought about it? Is he afraid? Does he expect Jacob to swoop in and steal everything he has worked to accomplish over these past 20 years? Did he bring these 400 men to protect him against that evil thief and liar who had obviously returned to hurt him? Are these 400 men an army to protect the land from that monster named Jacob, the grabber, the supplanter, the one who showed no regard for his family? And yet, Jacob bravely goes out to meet his brother and welcome him home. Well done, Esau. You may have done a lot of growing over the past 20 years. We certainly hope so. And then there's Jacob's response. When Jacob hears that Esau is coming with 400 men, he is terrified. All his past sins rush to accuse him. He knows for certain that Esau comes to kill him. He thinks about what he can do to protect his family and livestock and the other people with him from Esau. He divides them into two companies, so perhaps one of the companies can escape from that tyrant Esau, as Esau butchers the other company. Ooh. Finally, Jacob releases, realizes that the forces against him are more than he can handle, and he needs God to help him. He prays for help. Did you notice this is the first time we hear Jacob praying? He's 60. My stars. We want to believe he prayed through the previous 60 years, but we have no proof of it. The next morning, Jacob selects herds of camels and donkeys and sheep and goats and cows and sends each herd separately with a large space between them to Esau as a gift. Jacob tells the driver of each herd to tell Esau this herd is a gift from Jacob to Esau and Jacob's following him. Good choice. 
if Jacob is sending Esau gifts, he probably isn't planning to kill him. And for Jacob, the grabber, the thief, the one who is continually thinking about himself, it is good for him to choose a gift for his brother, to make up for all the things he has done to his brother in former years. It was good for him to finally treat his brother with respect, even if that was respect was given out of fear in hopes of protecting his own life. That night, Jacob sent his family across the river Jabbok to where they would hopefully be safe for the night. Then he sent everything he owned across the river and returned to be alone on the other side of the river. I wonder what he had planned to do there all by himself. What happens is a man came and wrestled with Jacob all night. Just before sunrise, the man tried to leave. And Jacob refused to allow this until the man told Jacob his name. The man refused. Jacob then asked to be blessed, and the man changed Jacob's name to Israel because Jacob wrestled with God and man and won. We like to think Jacob was a new man when he limped away from the wrestling match with a new name. Jacob even proclaims, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. And yet at sunrise, when he sees his brother coming in the distance with his 400 men, he places his wives and children in front of them, sending them out as human shields between himself and his brother, just in case. Wow, what a slimy guy. Ugh. Fortunately, the meeting between the brothers is not at all what Jacob accepts expects while both with both men crying and hugging and jacob offering to and esau offering to help jacob and guard him and wanting to return the gifts jacob insists that esau keep the gifts and sends esau away because he still doesn't trust his brother but he says he has to travel slowly because of the children and the young animals so the brothers part and we don't see them together. The rest of the Parsha is a series of stories of Jacob and the older brothers, older sons, making poor choices and being afraid. Daughter Dina is raped and Jacob does nothing. Dina's brothers Levi and Simeon are angry and destroy an entire town because of it. Jacob is worried about what the neighbors will think. He's not worried about his daughter. He's worried about what will the neighbors think. Reuben has sex with his stepmother, Bila. Jacob's favorite wife dies. And they are too far, far from the family burial cave to take her there, so she's buried by the road. Somewhere in here, in all of this horrible stuff going on in their lives, somewhere in here, we read about. God coming to Jacob, telling him to put away the foreign gods among them and travel to Bethel and build an altar to the Lord. This is his first altar. How old is he now? Quite a bit older. Jacob's relationship with God is slowly growing. It's taken a lot of years to get there. Our Parsha ends with Jacob finally arriving at the place where his father lives. His father dies, and Esau and Jacob together bury their father. Finally, after, what, 120 years? They come together. Sad that it took that long. Sometimes when I read the life of Jacob, I am overwhelmed with anger. What a horrible person he is, lying and taking lying to and taking advantage of his brother and father, hating his wife, using his children as human shields to protect his own life, being more concerned about neighbors than about his poor daughter who just got raped. Sometimes I read the story of Jacob and I feel overwhelmed with grief. I look at how faithful his father and grandfather were and how Jacob just threw out everything they had taught him. 
I look at the problems his family had to endure because of his unfaithfulness. Sometimes I read the glowing accounts the rabbis write about this wonderful godly person, Jacob, and I wonder who they're actually talking about. And I can't find support for these accolades in Torah or anywhere else in the Bible. We want to see good in this man, but when we look at his life closely, there is not a lot to commend him. It isn't until he is very old that he decides to talk to God, to follow God's directions, and be reconciled with his father and brother. So why do we even look at Jacob? Why do we study his life? Are we so intent on idolizing Jacob that we can choose to ignore the wrong he did? Or worse, choose to call evil good and good evil? For some, yes. And hating one's wife and daughter is held up as good because Jacob did it, and he's one of the patriarchs. I want to give us another reason for studying Jacob. In all of Jacob's adventures, God is there. Jacob demanded God do a long list of things to earn the right to be Jacob's God. God was okay with that. Jacob hated Leah. God blessed Leah. Jacob fought with Laban. God loved Jacob and caused Jacob to succeed. Jacob did not appear to acknowledge God in his life, but God never left him. Throughout Jacob's life, God was there, loving him, blessing him, making things work out for good, because that is what God is like. It is Jacob's bad. It is in Jacob's bad character that we can see how amazing and kind and good and forgiving God is. It is in Jacob's running from God that we can see clearly how God cannot be lost or dumped on the side, but continued to pursue Jacob for good. Some of us have some really nasty things in our past. God does not abandon us. There is nothing God cannot or will not forgive. God does not love the evil we have done, but God continues to love us and claim us and teach us how to be God's people even if it's one tiny baby step at a time, and maybe that baby step takes six years to do. God is faithful. There are people in our lives or in our world whom we despise for whatever reason, and perhaps we have completely valid reasons for despising them. However, regardless of the evil they have done, God still loves them. God continues to pursue them. God continues to work in their lives for good, just as God continues to work in our lives for good. Jacob teaches us that there is nothing we can do to make God stop loving us. Each of us are precious to God, whether we make poor choices like Abraham, or trust God completely like Isaac, or are scum like Jacob. God continues to work in our lives for good and will continue to work in our lives, even if it takes until we are 120, like Jacob, to become the people God created us to be. God, who started the good work in us, will bring it to completion, even if it takes our whole lives. Thanks be to God. We pray, Lord, you made us for yourselves for yourself, and our souls are hungry until we find our rest in you. Amen. <laughs>